know who you are, Chris. I just prefer to, if you use a cat as a handle, then I, that's how I type it. Unless you want your real name there. So next We're time, going, Shane. Chris, instead Good. of cat. All right. Are we actually, we, we recording now? Yeah, we're recording. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, we're good excellent. To go. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> this is uh, Shane Gibson with Digital Re uh, Rebar and the RackM team. Uh, today is uh, November 7th, and it's our fourth uh, Digital Rebar online meetup. Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, DRP32 uh, features. And actually, uh, we've since last time we've been on, we've cut 320 and 321. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, how, why and how we did that. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about 33 features and our upcoming plans for feature releases in the future. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about understanding stages and trying to demystify um, exactly uh, what stages are and how they work for us in the context of digital rebar uh, in terms of providing workflow. And last, uh, we'll open up the floor for community feedback and questions and answers. Um, last time on sometime in October, two weeks ago, uh, whatever the heck date that was in our V003 meetup, uh, we had some uh, interesting conversations uh, about, uh, let's see, we can bring it up here. Uh, we talked about uh, DRP32 features. We talked about feature tags. That was an interesting conversations uh, discussion on uh, how we're planning on using uh, Go-based feature tags to provide uh, platform side uh, clues to the UX as to uh, what that specific endpoint uh, on the platform side supports in terms of features so the UX can appropriately uh, render pages and capabilities uh, specific to an endpoints uh, version. Uh, features and capabilities. So it's a very important and powerful aspect uh, that we are looking forward to extending and embracing more going forward. Uh, we also talked a little bit about VirtualBox and Greg gave us a demo on VirtualBox and uh, we didn't have much in the way of community feedback last week. So hopefully we'll have some more this week. We see that uh, Chris has dropped in some uh, questions that he has in terms of feedback and we'll hopefully get to those as well. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Digital Rebar, our website rebar.digital and RackN is rackn.com. We are the company that provides uh, service support and uh, operational um, go-to market capabilities for enterprise companies uh, for the Digital Rebar product. Uh, at the end of every one of our um, agenda items, we have a whole bunch of links. So if you need any uh, questions, you have any questions, how to get in touch with us, um, you want to find some of our videos. We've put out a lot of videos and blog postings, etc. You'll find that at all of our meetups. And then lastly, uh, we do record all the meetups. And so we have the first three meetups recorded. So if you wanted to go back for posterity's sake and see us fumble around getting our feet as we get this whole operation off the ground, you can find those links at the bottom of the agenda. Uh, first and foremost, though, uh, we've got on board with us from the community. We've got uh, Chris Trees, Kat. Uh, as he's known in Pound community on the Slack. Uh, we have a, a newcomer, uh, David Bruce. David, welcome. And uh, an old timer as well, Will Dennis. Uh, guys, welcome. And then on the rack and team side, we've got um, filling in for Rob's face on the uh, Zoom conference is Steven Spector, who's running the controls behind the scenes for us. And then we have uh, Victor and Greg from the rack and team. So everybody welcome. and. Uh, Let's uh, kick off this shindig with version 3.2. So first of all, um, I'm going to chuck this out to Greg. Are you listening there, my friend? Yeah. So version 3.2, uh, we had originally talked about um, uh, sort of pushing and, and um, moving around from backlog to, to, to do for version 3.2. We had sort of this big, long list of interesting things we wanted to add to 3.2. And at some point last week, we kind of made a decision. Um, no, let's cut 3.2 now. Um, so talk to us a little bit about that process. What was the impetus behind that? So we were looking at a couple of things. One uh, was that there was a bug in the 
stages code that uh, kept it from becoming available whenever its corresponding boot environment became available. So we had fixed that and we'd been sitting on it and we were like, okay, okay, let's see. And so that was one of the drivers for us moving to 3.2. The other is we had reworked the content so that um, a lot of the Rackin specific kind of basic boot environments and stages um, were moving into the community and we were gonna get rid of the parallel CE versus non-CE kind of content and that became available. And so when those two things showed up, we decided we would um, cut the 3.2 release. Now, so, so that um, 3.2 or the content change was sort of a pretty big con uh, change uh, in terms of the content backend, sort of merging the rack end registered content and, and pushing some of the stages capability into the uh, community content. Is that right? That's right. Another uh, change of it as well was um, we were finding that uh, plugins and their corresponding content were starting to kind of diverge. And so we merged the content from the, like the IPMI subsystem uh, plugin and the packet IPMI and virtual, excuse me, virtual box IPMI plugins. They have their own content layers now. So that gets all bundled as a single unit. And that way you didn't have version drift and that got updated as a, as a pair. So that, the, that kind of set of things are what were driving us down that path. Right. Okay. So, so it sounded like we had a lot of big changes in flight and uh, we we're sort of interested in stabilizing, getting everything to a common content code base, fix a few bugs before we started adding new features. Correct. That's right. And of course, as soon as we got three, two cut, that bug that we thought we had squashed resurfaced in a different form. And that's why we cut three, two, one right afterwards. Is that the whole bug that we were trying to fix to get out there quickly, we brought back. And so um, we cut three, two, one after updating the unit tests to keep us from ever hitting that bug again so that it will yell at us if it fails next time. So um, that's why we got a quick turn on three, two, one. No, there is a, there is a note with that. We are thinking about, not, we aren't thinking, we are going to be turning releases more often so that that keeps moving and uh, stable kind of keeps moving forward a little quicker than what we had to have been going at about three to four to five months. So, Right, and that was actually going to be my next lead in. Um, let me ask Victor, um, from you, um, in that vein, what does that sort of mean for the project? Um, quicker releases. Um, what are we, what are the plans around that? Um, well, pretty much the plan is that we cut a release uh, every one to two weeks and that uh, obviously the release cadence is faster, but that means that um, we'll be, uh, you know, each new release will have little smaller chunks of uh, updated functionality. Um, for instance, I'm trying to get in, uh, I'm trying to pull some basic uh, repository um, template handling into the into the core and I hope to be able to get that out for the next release that we cut. So uh, more frequent smaller releases it sounds like is what we're looking forward to uh, with uh, DRP. Mm -hmm. And so Greg made a, a comment there about adding some unit tests to test for that stages bug uh, with a content refresh. Um, if I recall correctly, looking at our GitHub uh, messages, there are a number of other sort of unit tests that you've been working on in relation to uh, testing. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, Greg and I, we, 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 uh, we, we tend to add uh, unit tests every time we uh, fix a bug or uh, get new functionality in the system. So, so hopefully we'll have a, a strong focus on uh, unit tests. As, uh, that'll be a much more easier to roll out small discrete unit tests as we roll out small discrete functions and fixes. And so hopefully we can get uh, maintain quality coverage going forward with smaller releases a little bit yeah. easier. Yeah, so right now the, the GoTree reports at about 70% code coverage. Um, and we've had a goal to try and keep it above 70 and I think we slipped a little below right now. So we'll have probably a pass to go through to see what we're missing and try and pull some of that back up. The, the project 
when we started rewriting Digital Rebar version two in Go, we made a commitment to making sure we had a reasonable level of coverage. Go is a little tricky in that some of its error pathing creates for some paths that are harder to test than others, but that's a technical interestingness we could talk about later. But so we kind of set a baseline of about 70. And we've been holding that. I, I think there's parts that we could get better, um, particularly around like DHCP processing right now isn't tested as well as it should be. But um, that's kind of where we're at. And those actually run every time we check in code. And so if you're actually watching our GitHub um, events as you watch the pull request go through, you'll see Travis updating whether that succeeded or not. And then also it updates the code coverage per pull request so we have an idea of what changed and what's not being covered on each pull request. So the data is there and um, we've used it some in the past and we need to continue to make that a priority as we keep going forward. Awesome, looking forward to that. Um, let's move over a little bit to our project board, um, which is up on uh, the shared screen right now. Hopefully you guys can all see that. Yep. Yes, okay, good. Feedback is positive. Uh, so if, if we take a look at this, this was our original plan going forward for DRP version two. We had four features uh, enhancements along with some other bugs that we wanted to complete for three, two. And because like we mentioned earlier, we sort of made a big shift in uh, deciding uh, where to cut 3.2, uh, essentially uh, stabilize and fix some patches, um, reorg the content so we have a much better uh, um, story for our community users in terms of being able to use stages and workflow to some degree. Um, and so as a consequence, some of these fell by the white wayside. So let's go ahead and do a quick pass over the four. Um, Victor, you were um, heading up the machine inventory stuff, and I think that is mostly done. There were some smaller uh, additions you wanted to add to machine inventory. Uh, for those of you not familiar uh, with the machine inventory, that is a uh, solution that Victor uh, cut based on some previous work and experience that Rackham has had with the uh, chef-based OHI uh, model for doing inventory, which in-house at Rackham we rewrote as GoHI, G-O-H-A-I. Uh, and that does the machine inventory uh, process as part of one of the stages in the transitions, which we're going to talk a little bit more, uh, a little bit indirectly. Uh, Victor, what's your uh, take on that, that feature? Is that complete enough? Um, do you still want to hold it open for 3.3 for some additional fee, uh, enhancements, et cetera? Um, the most recent thing that I've done with GoHi is to uh, add some uh, file system reporting. Um, what file systems are there, how much disk space they use, whether or not they are mapped to actual physical devices or their virtual file systems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, still to do is some, uh, ma uh, some uh, matching inventory on uh, physical disks as seen by the operating system. Um, and you know, how soon I get to that is going to be driven primarily as to uh, who's asking for it, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I guess we'll we'll leave that open for a three three item, or we'll leave it in the to do column for the moment. Yeah, yeah. But as far as uh, everything else goes about using it, I mean, in the uh, since we've merged the repositories, um, the default uh, there's a stage for Go High baked into, or baked into the content now, and uh, by default, uh, whenever anything goes through the discovery phase, uh, the first thing it does is run Go High on the system. So. Okay. Uh, and then, um, Greg, default stage transition. Um, yeah, so that's still pending, and we will probably hit much more detail on that when we actually talk about our stage discussion that's coming up. Okay. But, uh, it needs to stay, and it will be probably the baseline for the next release. Okay. So we'll leave that in for 3.3. Uh, and then we have enable local FS HTTPS endpoint and add embedded assets, which I know neither of which have been touched. We're going to move those uh, back into the backlog for now. Uh, and I think what we'll do is we're going to keep 3.3 three, 
at these two items to uh, beef up machine inventory and default stage transition. Um, Greg, Victor, do you guys have any other features you feel that either are in the backlog currently? Um, and actually, we need to evaluate this one that um, Rob has dropped in. Uh, but we've got update plugin model, clean up exploded ISOs, uh, archive compression handling. So those are some of the backlog items. Is there something we should put in the backlog and, and or move to to do that you think should be cut for 3.3? Strangely enough, I believe your merge C and OS templates, that is now complete, actually. Yeah, that's what I was just going to touch on. I hadn't seen, uh, I didn't see that Rob had dropped this in on us. So um, I'm not sure why I don't get a, I'm not sure how the heck he dropped this in on us. I'll, I'll resolve this. Um, offline, but I think that this is actually referring to the uh, work that we just talked about. Uh, Greg covered mostly in terms of reorg of backend content uh, versus uh, community content. So, and we're getting a whole lot of feedback from somebody. I don't know who. All right, much better. Can I make a comment on the uh, machine inventory one? Absolutely. Um, so if it, it's like voluminous in the JSON, the one you show machine, I, I don't know what could be done about that. It obviously is belonging to the machine. Uh, I don't know enough about the JSON output. You know, if it was collapsible, which, you know, it's, it's just when I go to look at stuff in machines, I have to like wade through like six miles of of so Will, I think you're referring to the command line when you do a show machines, DRPC yeah. live show machine. Yeah, I'm trying to get some other attribute states or whatever. And uh, so I don't know if there's such a thing as a linked thing. I and mean, I'm not a Go yeah. person. I don't, I don't know what's to be done about it, but it, it, it's a lot to go through when you're looking at the JSON. That's all. Okay. Yeah. Part of that's just a side effect as to uh, how we store per machine data. Um, there are a couple of ways that we could resolve that. Um, however, they may break some people without, uh, you know, giving people plenty of time to uh, switch over. Um, pretty much what happens with the machine inventory is that every time, uh, you know, GoHi uh, runs and updates the system, it just puts a parameter on the machine. And since that parameter is literally part of the machine object, it, um, you know, it gets returned whenever you do an API call to the machine. Um, yeah, there's um, there's probably some things we could do. Um, Will, can you open an issue for that? And uh, we can start throwing around some ideas in there. Um, specific uh, things like maybe on the CLI having a short flag or something that doesn't print parameters, but just the base fields, those kind of things. Um, let's, let's use an issue for that and um, kind of uh, have some discussion out there on that. All right, that's cool. Um, should, should it reference 470, 478 is it? Um, if yeah, you actually address, yeah. you can say as a side effect of 478, we're saying All right, that's cool. these are unwieldy, so that's not bad. Yeah, I, I like the, uh, the it's only display problem, so doing like a flag, if it could cut that bit out, that would be perfect. Because it absolutely belongs with the machine, its attributes in the machine. So, you know. So JQ can do that with filters, um, but that puts sort of the onus on the side of someone knowing how to form filters. With yeah. JQ. Um, for some of that stuff, you know, we probably need to adopt a policy of if you didn't ask for it, you won't get it back in the API call. But uh, you know, that's, that's part of the conversation we need to have in an issue. Right. Okay, that's excellent. And uh, so, Will, that's on your plate to uh, add a, a note to the machine inventory, uh, ticket number 478. We'll look forward to that and we'll kick it around in house and figure out what's a good solution for that. But I uh, feel your pain on that one myself, too. So, yeah. yeah. Community Slack is fine, too. We can discuss it there some, too, if we want, which is fine. All right. Thanks, guys. Perfect. So, uh, going forward for uh, planning before we wrap this up. Um, uh, going into version 3.3, uh, we're going to leave machine inventory on, uh, some more work around default stage transitions, and uh, I believe that we're fully buttoned up with the merge CE and OS templates that uh, Rob dropped in here. 
I will get that resolved and actually I'm going to move it to completed for now and I'll move it back to to do if there's something we've missed in the requirements that Rob had pushed out for there. Are there any other questions or comments around planning? Um, the other thing that will probably go into 3.3 is I've been working on a uh, patch to um, make a repository installation for OS installation and post OS uh, install provisioning um, easier to manage in the templates. Um, for the right, repos? Have to front load everything. And uh, I'll probably be wrapping that up this week. And so, yes, Shane, it is the repos thing. Right? For the repos, okay. Yeah. Um, Victor, can you please get an uh, uh, issue opened up with that and some information, uh, an uh, issue of type enhancement, and then I'll, I'll prod it through the queue. Sure. Perfect. Uh, and then moving on, uh, if I can find my, here we go. Uh, moving on, we're going to talk a little bit about stages. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with stages, uh, I have a short sort of training deck I'm going to uh, force you all to step through, uh, mostly so I get to use you as guinea pigs um, moving forward with the training deck. Um, got a little good bit of good feedback earlier from Will uh, offline before the meetup, so he had some really nice suggestions in there that I've incorporated. Uh, for those of you who um, uh, have any feedback or suggestions on uh, the understanding stages, I would love to hear them from you. Uh, as I develop this, I want to make this cohesive and understandable. After we burn through the slide deck real quick, we'll open up a little bit of discussion to, um, with the RAC and team and community about stages, and hopefully we can try and clarify this. Uh, I'm going to present, and do you guys still see my presented? Yep. Or do you see my uh, window? window? It's full screen. Full screen, okay. Uh, so digital rebar provision, understanding stages. Basically, we want to understand um, what is uh, workflow and stages. So stages essentially enables workflow. And it's important to understand it's single machine workflow. So we're carefully avoiding uh, the, the phrase or, or term orchestration, since within RackN we relate orchestration more to uh, large clusters or fleets of machines or across a whole bunch of uh, machines. So uh, we're referring to this as single machine workflow. And uh, we're going to talk about it within the implementation uh, of digital rebar provision version three. A really fast summary is uh, stages gives you the ability to on a per machine uh, basis be able to step through the install process from nothing to something. And each of those stages needs to be controlled. And there are a number of inputs and outputs that can affect how you get from the beginning to the end stage of an operating system with a baseline configuration on it. Um, so the, there are a number of um, uh, advanced workflow options, uh, things like fan in and fan out. We're not going to talk about those explicitly in this deck. Uh, we can cover some of those capabilities in conversation further on. But again, uh, this deck is oriented more around sort of an introduction or a 101 level course on what stages are and how uh, they, they operate within the context of an installation. And like I said, it's sort of a stepwise fashion from one state to the next as you start from uh, actually discovering a machine to the end state of something installed with something on it. And some of the stages can actually have uh, concepts of stop and wait where external things can happen. So if you think about that, there's a lot of complex things that you can uh, enable uh, to do by orchestrating the stages themselves in conjunction with something else. Now, something else might be a configuration management server, uh, configuration management database. It might be just uh, asset inventory system. It might be interaction with uh, something like uh, Ansible, uh, SaltStack, Puppet Chef, where you can do more complex things. There's a number of things that you can do um, that allow you to uh, orchestrate very complex orchestration in conjunction with the single machine workflow. And here's sort of an example from our UX of a stage map where we have sort of discover, packet discover, Terraform ready, 
And then the next step, Ubuntu 1604, packet SSH keys, complete, no wait. We'll talk about all of that a little bit later uh, in, in generic terms. So again, uh, it's important to disting distinguish um, what we are talking about, and what we're not talking about. So there's, uh, we're, like I said, we're talking about stages, which shouldn't be confused with boot ends. And I say that because there are boot ends or boot environments, which is sort of a description of an OS install that have the same name as a stage. So don't confuse um, what a stage of Ubuntu 1604 install is versus a boot environment of Ubuntu 1604 install. The stage itself carries um, the ability to enact a boot environment. Um, they're related to each other, but the operation of the stage isn't the same as the boot environment, if that makes sense. And again, the stage is used as a workflow flow to install a boot environment, not exclusively, but it can do other things, but that's one of its, its meanings. And I, it's one of the distinctions between stage and boot environment. Uh, what we're gonna cover is sort of a, a semi-fictional, fictional-ish version of stages. It's actually semi-fictional because some of these are actually real stages, um, but they do correlate uh, fairly closely to the overall process of how we get from nothing to some end state. And the, the four stages that we're going to sort of examine will be a discovery, install, customize, and complete. And then walking through how all of that fits. If we start out uh, on the left, we've got a provision endpoint. And on the right, uh, we have a target machine that we want to walk through the stages. Target machine powers on. We get our DHCP request response. And then we start into our first sort of stage setup, which is in this case discovery. And during the discovery stage, we're going to start all of the Pixie stuff that uses TFTP and the Pixie protocols to be able to start the sledgehammer uh, image. Sledgehammer in our terminology is uh, a live boot OS that allows us to implement interesting things uh, like stages, do inventory uh, and other things. And so we use uh, Sledgehammer as part of our discovery process. Uh, the next step going from uh, the discovery stage is to transition into an install stage. Uh, in this case, uh, we need to enact a Pixie reboot because we're gonna do in this example, an OS install from uh, uh, Pixie uh, boot and images brought down to the host. We have the ability within the digital rebar provision solution to do sort of a DD to disk image provisioning solution. That would be actually done in the sledgehammer stage. Those are sort of independently and different. But in this example, we're going to do a Pixie and reboot. In this case, we're going to get the boot environment. Uh, Ubuntu 16.04 install, for example, has some parameters, some profiles, and some tasks associated with that. And that's where we're going to start actually installing on the target machine uh, the operating system. Uh, once that process is completed, we move on next to the customized stage where we want to add some tweaks and fiddle with the OS uh, before we do anything else, i.e. reboot the machine. And so at this point, we would then do, for example, the access keys stage, which allows us to inject SSH keys into the operating system configuration so we can have network access to it uh, remotely after the install is done. And then kind of, it may not be intuitive, but we do have a stage called complete, but complete just allows us to do some sort of final post cleanup stuff. In this case, the stage itself is called complete no wait, which essentially means let's exit from the stages system, we're done, uh, and let's kick the boot in the machine and reboot into its final OS. And how we have an operating system uh, where we've walked through uh, four uh, semi-fictional stages and success, we're done. So that's sort of a kind of a brief tour of how the stages flow through each other in a very simplified manner. Um, stages themselves are just a description of actions that the endpoint needs to enact on and, and uh, realize. And we use JSON and YAML, uh, you can use either or, essentially to describe a stage. 
and uh, stages have various elements that they use to construct the actual contents of the stage. Uh, we talked about boot ends. We sort of passed over uh, parameters, tasks. Uh, we also have templates, profiles, and uh, an interesting piece that a lot of people probably haven't seen yet necessarily is a runner state definition. We'll talk a little bit about the runner uh, in discussion in a moment. It's important to note also that not all of the elements are required for a stage, uh, only uh, a given set of the elements in the contents are required depending on what you're trying to do. And so you may not necessarily see all of these elements. And uh, if we were to take a look at our example, Ubuntu 16.04 install, we have sort of the YAML here where we specify the boot environment. So again, remember my, my statement earlier that the uh, stage and the boot environment is uh, are separate entities. So in this case, we're specifying the boot environment of Ubuntu 16.04 install, which has its own content to get the OS in some configured manner onto your machine. We have some, have some metadata that's consumed mostly by the UX. Uh, we have its name, and then we see some parameters, and we actually see that there are parameters that are optional, and a couple lines down, we have uh, required parameters. So a, a stage can specify that you must have parameters or you optionally can have parameters. Profiles are a collection of parameters. Uh, and then again, I mentioned the runner weight. So the runner weight state is set to true in this case, and we have a task of change stage as part of the stage to be able to transition to another stage uh, and no templates defined. So that's sort of a, a very quick walkthrough of sort of what it looks like uh, in content. Uh, some examples we sort of touched on complete no weight. So in that case, we have a local boot environment, which simply means boot to your local disks. Don't try and do anything else. Uh, we have no templates, tasks, or parameters. The runner is set to no weight, and there's no profile. So again, that no weight means sort of exit and uh, go on to the next thing immediately, which is reboot, and you're done. Uh, so it's very simple. There's not a whole lot of info in, in, info in it, but it's a very uh, important one to finish the transition. We touched on the SSH access stage. In that case, there's new bo no boot environment or no templates, but we do have tasks in this case, which are SSH access, which is the actual task itself, which uh, injects the keys for us. And then we also want to be able to transition out of this stage into another stage. Hence, we have the chain stage and the runner is set to wait for it to complete and we have no profiles. Uh, the Ubuntu 16.04 stage, obviously we saw that in uh, YAML previously. So we saw that we had the boot environment Ubuntu. There are no templates, no required parameters. We have the change stage, which was an optional parameter, which means we can change to some other stage if we want. And then the runner is set to wait for us to be able to change stage if we decide to. And again, no profile. Uh, and last, I mean, what is a change stage, right? So. Uh, change stage is a stage, <laughs> and it has a boot and env of local, no templates, no parameters. The task is simply change stage. Uh, the runner is set to no weight, and there's no profile. So that allows us to externally say, I want to change stage, uh, if that makes sense. Last, I think, uh, slide, we have um, just a summary of some of the actions that stages can have. Uh, so we talked about uh, complete no wait, which is sort of complete finish actions and exit from stages, but above that is the complete stage, which means complete and wait. So in that case, something else external to the workflow in the system is going to have to transition us out of this state since we're in a wait state at this point. And that might be used where we do call outs to uh, configuration management server to dump go high inventory uh, for asset management and tracking purposes or for infrastructure as code tenants where we might actually use that inventory information later on to construct uh, uh, larger, more complex cluster configurations, for example. Uh, Discover, uh, we talked a little bit about it, is sort of enact by, enacted primarily by the sledgehammer image. We do things like inventory, SSH access and change stage in, in the Discover. 
None means ignore the machine. So don't do anything to this machine. I, I want it to be the way it is. Leave it alone. Uh, the runner service, uh, we'll talk a little bit about. Runner keeps coming up as this new thing I think a lot of people probably haven't uh, heard of before. And then SSH access and boot end, which we've talked about. So that's it. That's sort of the, the brief tour of understanding stages. Um, there's a number of other training decks available. They're linked in the back slides. Uh, this uh, slide will be updated over time as some more training decks are added. If you wanted to explore some of these other uh, introductory training decks. And again, feedback on those from anyone in the community is as welcome and then resources. So that's uh, the quick uh, introduction. Uh, feedback, does that make sense to people? Does it help sort of illuminate sort of what stages are for anyone that might've had questions around that? I put everybody to sleep. Everybody fell asleep, okay. okay. <laughs> All right, well, I'm not gonna put Will on the spot because he spent a little bit of time uh, reviewing it. Uh, Chris, how about you? Did you fall asleep or did you follow that and did that make sense? What, what, what? I'm busy multitasking here. I wasn't paying attention, Shane. <laughs> All right, well, we won't, uh, we won't belabor that anymore. Um, Greg and Victor, um, we talked a little bit uh, about runners. Can you sort of just give us a, a high level summary? What is a runner? I mean, what does it provide for us? Um, to answer that question, I have to touch on something that uh, the slide deck didn't go over. Uh-oh. Yeah, how stages interact with tasks. How, say that again? How stages interact with tasks. Yeah, so I, I thought about that, putting the slide deck together, because we have that larger, um, uh, slide that shows, you know, all the blah, 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 shit going on. <laughs> and uh, it, it gets very complex. So that is a good point. Um, and I think that's something that I would push into a 201 uh, sort of more advanced topic. Okay. Um, do you think so, that I, I should cover that uh, in this intro? Yes, um, mostly because from the point of view of actually doing things on a machine, uh, the most important thing that a stage has is a list of tasks that uh, get uh, that whenever you switch to a new stage, it replaces the current task list that's on a machine with tasks from that stage. And then the runner starts executing the tasks on the uh, newly changed task list on the machine. Sure. And so what ha and so um, the flags, the, the runner control flags on the stage mostly control what happens to or what what the runner does whenever it runs out of tasks. Right. And okay, that's, so good. that's where the wait and the no wait flags come in. Yeah. Okay, so Victor, could I try to understand this? Mm -hmm. So stages have a list of tasks and the runner starts executing those tasks, you know, in an ordered series. And when it completes the last task, it goes in, it typically goes into a wait state and waits for another stage to be transitioned to, which has its own set of tasks, correct? Um, indirectly. So what happens is whenever, whenever the runner goes into a wait state, what it's waiting for is for the machine's task list to change. And that can happen either by you pushing a task directly onto that task list or by changing the stage to something else, which will then reset the task list and uh, you, know, you have a whole new bunch of things to execute. Hmm. So, so as long as there's no transition, it'll keep waiting for more jobs that you keep pushing on there. Yep. And yeah. so Maybe. then what's the trigger to say, screw you, Q, I'm done with this stage, let's transition. Um, the tasks can have, uh, each task we have a defined set of exit tasks from uh, or exit flags from a task, and one of those is stop waiting. No wait. Right. No. So there's two two paths to stop the the runner. Okay. One is the the stage can be marked uh, runner wait false. Okay. And so what that says is if you ever if the runner's running and he's in, and it's in that stage and it gets to the task list and it says, I've run all my tasks, do I have any more? And it goes, no, and then it checks the stage flag and says, 
oh, this stage is a stopping point, so let me just stop. The other way you can stop is you can write a task that has the return code of stop. And what happens is, in that case, the task runs, returns stop, and then the runner exits at that point. That way, the, the tasks themselves can also say, wait, 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 I have to stop, we have to stop. And the idea is that you might choose to stop a task, for example, um, if you're in an install boot environment, um, a lot of times we want to stop execution and not reboot because we want the install process to finish its jobs and then reboot when it's ready. So that's an example of where a task says stop, right? Or right. Stop. So there's, mm -hmm. there's kind of two paths to exit the runner. Now, you, we asked, somebody asked or mentioned tangentially, what is a runner? And the runner, when we say that, is really DRPCLI running a machine's command called process jobs. And it then knows to put itself into a loop, watching um, for events. It actually registers with a uh, WebSocket to pay attention to events on certain devices, or it, itself, in fact, so that it can watch if it becomes runnable or not. It also then processes the task list, like Victor said, and will continue processing tasks until it either gets told to stop or it itself gets rebooted or whatever. Now, the implication to that is that you change a task list on a machine either by changing its stage, which will cause it to reset its task list, or as Victor alluded to, you can add tasks to the end um, with some rules to the task list. And the idea there is um, in some cases, we have um, some tasks that are kind of like discovery tasks that might find like, does this machine have this type of RAID controller? Oh, it does. Let me add the configure that RAID controller task to the machine's task list, okay? That's the use, that's one of the uses for that kind of code path, all right? So one of the things that we're kind of porting in the background um, is the uh, component update feature that was in V2. It needs to be able to dynamically modify the task list so that we don't have this thousand, you know, thousand entry task list for every update that might be applied to any machine out in the universe. This way we can dynamically add what's discovered to update to the task list as it goes. So, <laughs> Did, was that a nice, simple discussion? Yeah. Sorry, that was probably way too much, but. Well, <laughs> can I ask, is, is the runner is a client side thing, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, and a runner is an instance of DRP CLI? Yes. yes. Okay. It, it, so Will, if you wanted to boot one of your nodes just into Sledgehammer, and yep. Then you logged into it, you would actually see if you in the process listing the RPCLI uh, command call with the machine's ID, and that's it actually registering itself back to the endpoint and then pulling uh, jobs off the queue to itself. Okay, so when it's not a daemon though, right? It is not. Okay, so when it when it exits with, I guess it's complete no wait, that terminates the DRPCLI process, correct? Correct. Is it, can something come along later and reinstantiate it? Yes. So um, the details there are the boot environments, the installed boot environments, and the sledgehammer boot environments are set. If you actually look at their templates, to run DRPCLI process machines as one of the last things they do as part of their boot process. So like the kickstart file has a run DRP CLI in it, for example. Um, same with the precede post install script. The runner service that Shane mentioned in the, is a way for you to run DRP CLI as a process on a post installed operating system. And in that case, we actually install it as a um, system D service, it also has a system five as well as a upstart script so that you can run it in those environments. But let's just stick with the system D version. It will run it 
under system D, system D will restart it um, and it will sit there and then watch the machine for tasks as well. So the idea there is you could actually have it installed as part of your install process. And then when the machine boots up, it would start DRP CLI, running it as a process to then continue doing additional work if you wanted to have it run tasks through stages um, after the install rebooted. So that's an option. Um, the reason that's shown up, if you're wondering, is we use it with Terraform so that Terraform can block completely until the node has finished installation, rebooted up, and is able to then take actions as a um, running user. Which actually touches, I think, um, the, one of the intro slides where there was Terraform ready state in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So does that... Okay. Any other questions around that, Will, or anyone else in the community? I'll, I'll hit you all up in community. I think I think it's. Um, I'm still trying to wrap my brain around it, but um, I think it's like obviously critical to understand how it works because it's actually the thing that does stuff. Yeah, it it's the thing that lets you do tasks, right? One of the things that we're trying to achieve with this is the ability to build reusable units in the form of tasks that can run in multiple environments that you can then compose together with the stages. And the reason we, we think we, the reason this is important to us is that we don't necessarily believe in adding everything into Kickstart files as hard-coded elements in Kickstart files. So we, we kind of want these things in forms that we can add. Or gigantic post-install script. <laughs> right. So that we can actually build them in small units that we can test, that we can then reuse, and, and that kind of thing. So that's why this is showing up. It keeps us from building, you know, 5,000 line Kickstart files that you hope work. Yeah, no, that makes total sense, actually. And, and, and the whole if logic, like if this, parameter exists, then do this task or task. That makes sense. Right. The, the thing that didn't make sense is like when, when in the UX, it, it has the node as runnable. And it, what it didn't make sense to me is like, oh, I have to set it to non-runnable to yeah. get it to do something. It's just like. It's yeah, so like that, running, right? so let's touch on that. I kind of mentioned it before when we were doing our feature review. And so that uh, fixed default stages, one of the things that in using this um, that has come about is that the runner is very aggressive. It will run tasks that show up on the machine. There are certain times where you don't want it to do that. And so right now you have to for example, if you're not fully automating the full process from end to end with a stage map and you want the system to kind of stop and pause and then you want to make some decisions about the machine and then you want to change its stage to move it forward, you have to be careful in that if you need to like reboot the node or something in between that, you need to tell the runner to stop. And the way you tell the runner to stop is you can mark it not runnable the machine and that will cause the runner if it's running to stop executing tasks and wait for runnable to become true again now oh i see i see it the runner is still present and and you're just saying stop listening for tasks correct i got it so in in, in one of your examples for the rest of the community you had a machine go to sledgehammer wait which is equivalent to Terraform Ready in some of the slides where it's sitting there, it's been discovered, and it's waiting for more tasks, right? Just in case you want to provision it, whatever. And then you said, let's switch to the Ubuntu install. Well, as part of that, you then had to go reboot the node. In between the time it took for you to move to reboot the node, the runner on the sledgehammer noticed that there were more tasks to run <laughs> and started putting the SSH keys in place and all the other stuff that it was going to run after the Ubuntu operating system had been laid down and even got so far as setting the change stage 
back to booting from local as if the machine had finished installing. Yeah, I noticed that. And I was like, well, wait a minute. You didn't even do, I didn't know it, it, it processed the SSH keys, huh? Yeah, it did all of it. <laughs> it okay. It said done. I could not do the install because of the nature of installs. Right. And so this is where one of the features that we're going to add for 3.3 in that, in that uh, feature enhancement that Shane referenced, this one, the default stage transitions, is we're going to pull the stage transitions out of the, 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 um, out of the stage task list directly. We're going to um, have it pay attention to if the boot environment changes. So like if the runner sees the boot environment's changed, then it will stop running tasks. That way we can handle this case of, wait, I just changed boot environments. I shouldn't run any tasks until I get into that boot environment, right? Um, things like that. So there'll be a few sequencing changes that will make some of this more intuitive where you don't have to worry about, did I stop the runner? Did I do this thing right? Um, have it pay attention to some of the information that's already okay, there. That makes sense. So, um, so the other thing is then the task list is asynchronous. It, it'll like do what it can. It's not an ordered. Uh, it is, no, no, no. Okay, so yeah, let's be clear on so, that. So guys, we're uh, down to five minutes. Oh, okay. And I think we can go down this rabbit hole for a long time. I think what it, it, it illuminates is what we might want to do is do a little bit more of a sort of mid-level deeper dive into stages and tasks in the next meetup. Yeah, um, yeah, that's we, great. Shane. We, do need to, we do need to wrap up. And uh, so the, the remaining things we had to talk about uh, moving on is the um, community feedback, which we got a whole bunch of actually indirectly there on stages and tasks in conjunction with that presentation. Um, we had some questions from Chris. I'm seeing what happened to them in the, uh, here we go, uh, community feedback. Um, Chris, are you, did you find your mic yet? Do I need a proctor for you? Proctor. Oh, he didn't, he didn't Hello? Find it. Oh, here he is. Is this uh -oh. me? I don't know. Uh oh, this that is, is you, I think. Oh, wow. I got a mic. Um, yeah, w basically what we're discussing, it was exactly what my question was, was, you know, there's some sort of protocol and stuff going on between Sledgehammer and, and, uh, and uh, the, you know, in DRP. And that, that's, I, I'm, I was starting to call it the handoff. And you're trying to prep machine. And I, I get what you're trying to do. And I really like that idea. I'm just trying to figure out well, actually, you know, to put it back in the community, I'm almost think I just, just should follow what Will's doing, trying to document that for, you know, what I got to do. And maybe that will help, you know. So that was my only conclusion of that. But, but the handoff was exactly what you guys were just talking about. Okay. The there are more there's more that we can talk about with regard to the ansible terraform side if, if that's that's a reasonable future topic that's somewhat related but different than stages and tasks and that's a reasonable topic to touch on in the future if people want to talk about that yeah and i think it was just as uh, basically at the end of all that you're handing it off to something and i i can see what you're trying to do. I just, I think Will was just using uh, Ansible too, right, Will? Yeah, I'd, so if, in my mind, Terraform consumes DRP as a mechanism and, and what I was hoping is DRP could trigger Ansible. It could kick off an Ansible run, which we're talking about. And I, I realize it's not, there's a little bit of design consideration there, right? But um, I, the, the, my target is to get a one pass type of system, if, if possible. So that is, uh, it's a good point. Um, there's a lot of discussion about that because there's a lot of um, heated debate about um, where digital rebar should hand off 
and where does our, our role end and where does um, additional stuff carry on, uh, primarily because of what I mentioned specifically what um, workflow is not, which is orchestration. Uh, orchestration being cross-node, cluster-based, more complex orchestration, which you tend to uh, start delving into when you do things like Ansible playbooks and you're trying to bring up, you know, for example, a MongoDB or MySQL cluster or, you know, more complex infrastructure. Um, so there's a lot of debate about where those lines are and where the handoffs are. We absolutely can do integrations. And in fact, we have plans for doing integrations with a number of the configuration management services. Ansible is one that we've already started integrating with and we've demonstrated uh, using the Kubernetes uh, Kube Spray uh, uh, playbooks to, to deploy a, a fairly complex Kubernetes clusters across infrastructure provisioned by DRP. So some of those mechanisms are in place already, and I suspect that a lot of what you're, you're wanting to do can be leveraged off similar uh, work there. Um, I'm going to wrap the conversation up with that because we're starting to run out of um, uh, time here we do have one last question that came in uh, from the community on the group chat from David Bruce uh, the question was uh, if um, during provisioning uh, and the endpoint is forced to reboot in the middle of the provisioning can the provisioning cycle recover so to speak so um, Victor Greg do you guys want to touch on that briefly and please try and keep it to about a minute or so and then we yes. can wrap up yeah, the quick answer is yes, yes it can. can. Now the task list is maintained and then um, right now it will rerun those tasks. It'll rerun and continue the tasks where the task failed. Those show up, uh, the tasks running show up in the jobs object so you can see what failed, when it failed and the sequence that way. And then here shortly as part of the feature request those tasks will get reset in the non-persistent environments. So the idea is that in things like Sledgehammer and the OS install environments, where if the machine reboots into those, those workflows will get completely rerun so that you end up with a guarantee on what comes back. It's mostly there already. Yeah. Okay, that's great. One quick question. If you're not using DHCP uh, from uh, DRP, if it's external, can the endpoint be turned off and all of the target systems continue to run as expected? Um, yeah, that's, that's a handoff decision, but the default case is once a machine's installed, DRP doesn't have to touch it. Or it doesn't have to touch DRP really, is the model. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, we the, the DHCP system is mostly independent from everything else. Um, so if you don't want to use our DHCP, you know we we will work just fine with someone else using with, with uh, someone else's DHCP server. Uh, we don't really have a good way to switch DHCP servers on and off on a per system basis right now. You might want to add some sort of negative reservation thing. Yeah, that's kind of <laughs> it's kind of a weird idea, but yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, everybody, that's it. We're running out of time here. Uh, we'll have V005 posted, uh, which is set for the 21st of November, if my math is correct. Uh, we'll get the agenda out for version five. Uh, thank you very much for everybody's participation. We had some really great conversations about stages, uh, workflow, tasks, and transitioning. Uh, I think that really helps to focus a little bit on uh, sharpening the, the understanding stages slide deck for me, and hopefully it'll give us some good uh, jumping off points for future conversations. Uh, any last words from friends and community on uh, before we wrap up? Thanks, Shane. Nope. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. See you next time. Appreciate your time. Cheers.